I want to just commence with a hadith, a sharif, and uh, it has some ba'af in it, it has some weakness in it. And the weakness is due to, the muhadith will say, someone like Imam al Haytham, he said, the reason why the weakness of this hadith is that one of the rawis, Abu Hafs, uh, who is a companion of Anas ibn Malik, he's mashur, he's unknown. It's a weak hadith in that sense, but it's a wonderfully illustrative hadith. Meaning, it will explain the point that I'm trying to, to get at. And it's narrated, as far as I know, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, inshallah, and I think it's narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah. And the hadith says, إِنَّ مَثَلَ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَمَثَلَ النُّجُومِ فِي السَّلَامِ Indeed, the scholars, the ulama, are like the stars that are in the sky. يُهْتَدَى بِهَا فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ إِذَا أَنْفَمَسَتِ النُّجُومِ when the stars in the sky, when they go out, when they fall, when the twinkle goes, people lose their way. You see the stars, the Hadith says, are used to guide the people on the land and sea at night time. The stars are hung up on the sky and people use them to guide themselves in the land and the sea. Now when the stars fall or when they go, they disappear people lose their way because they no longer have the light to guide them in the land. And the hadith is saying that uh, the ulama are like that. They're like the stars. They're, they give Islam its splendor. They give it its beauty. And they have the guidance which people can use to guide themselves in the dunya. So in the hand of the ulama of Iran is the navigation, is the compass. And this hadith nicely sort of brings out that contrast and comparison, even though it has some ba'af in its center. And the point really of this hadith, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we will be, inshallah, discussing one of those stars. One of those stars who is a part of the galaxy of stars of this deen. And he was to the Islam, Abu Hamid, Al Ghazali, may Allah's abundant blessing and mercy be on him. Now, I do have to confess from the, from the outset that I, I know that I will not be able to do any justice to this imam. Not in this format tonight. And even if we had a lot of time, I know that I personally I couldn't match the task of even coming near to explaining to you and highlighting the greatness of this imam. And those of us who in the audience perhaps are more advanced in our knowledge of the deen and have sat and have tasted some of the, the greatness of Imam al-Ghazali, I do apologize from the outset. The format will be, it may not quench your thirst. Uh, the level may not be to what you're seeking, but inshallah ta'ala, we will try and go through some important aspects of his life. Or his life. <coughs> Basically, I wanted to touch on his name, um, some, of the, uh, some, some of the background of his life, some basic aspects of his life, the biography of the great Imam. Then I want to touch on some of the statements made about Imam al Ghazali, and then talk about some aspects of his possible. That I think for most of us who are untrained anyway, for most of, most of us who are perhaps on the lower levels of learning, where we haven't quite reached the, the higher aspects of learning, some of the aspects of his possible can be extracted and convenient for us to understand and maybe apply. And lastly, I really want to just touch on some of the lessons that we can draw from the life of Imam al-Azali so we, as the Muslim community, as a people, can implement in our own lives to take lessons from it and practically implement those teachings, those lessons in our lives. So, I really want to then begin, and bear with me, with a very simple aspect of the Imam, and that is his name his kunya and his nisbah. And the biographies, they mention some of the names of Imam al-Ghazali. One of them, of course, is Abu Hamid. The father of Hamid literally means, not that the biographers tell us he had a son called Hamid, but he was known by that kunya. And mostly, his name has Muhammad in it three times. So he's Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Ahmed, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Then they add 
a nisbah that they give him a name, a relative name. One of them is Atusi. Atus is a sort of town area in the uh, region of Khurasan. Khurasan is in, uh, it was an area that back then bordered Afghanistan, Iran, that region. Now it's in Iran proper, Khurasan. And he was from a little city there, Hukultus. Uh, That's why his name is Al Tusi. And then he's also known as a Shafi'i because Imam Al Ghazali was of the Shafi'i Madhab. Now, how many prominent ulama are there? How many Imams of the Madhabs are there that we know have survived, prominent ulama of the Madhabs? How many do we have? Can anyone say? It? Four great Imams? Anyone have any idea? One of them is Imam Ahmad Abu Hanifa radiallahu an. He's definitely one. Imam Ahmad Imam Ahmad Hanbal radiallahu an definitely. Imam Shafi'i was another one. The school Imam Al Ghazali followed in his law, in his fiqh. One more, Imam Malik. May Allah be pleased with them all. These are four of the great, the superlative Imams. Their madhabs are the ones that have survived, and the Muslims follow. Till this day. So the, the Madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, perhaps in quantity, has the largest following all of Turkey, nearly all of the subcontinent, parts of Iraq and the Middle East, and then the Maliki, then Imam Shafi'i, and then, of course, the Hanbali Madhab. So Imam Al Ghazali was of the Shafi'i school. Now, people, most of the ulama in Khurasan, in Khurasan, that region in, in, in Iran today, were Shafi'i. So it's quite interesting that the history of Iran was actually Sunni Shafi'i mainly. So that town of Tuls was mainly Shafi'i. So Imam Al Ghazali was of the Shafi'i school. And then another list he is given is Al Ash'ari. Imam Al Ghazali was mainly, broadly, within the school of Aqidah of Imam Abu Hassan Al Ash'ari. Imam Ahl Sunnah was his title. He, Imam Abu Hassan Al Ash'ari, defended the aqeed of Islam against some of the sects in his time, like the Mu'tazila. They were talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his attributes in an incorrect way, talking about aspects of the aqeedah in a very confusing and, and, and incorrect way. Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari defended that, the, uh, the, the, the correct aqeedah from those attacks by the Mu'tazila. So Imam al Ghazali was broadly al Ash'ari in his. Theology. He mainly took the theological principles of Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, but he did differ with the Imam in a lot of principles, a lot of basic and fundamental principles as well. He was born 450 years after the Hijrah. So, uh, in that in Tuls, as I mentioned, in the city of Tuls. Now, the Nisba, the name al Ghazali, some people say, that the name Al Ghazali comes from the profession of his family. So his father and his uh, grandfather, his family, the family business was spinning wool. They used to spin wool and they owned a shop. So hence, some people say because Imam Al Ghazali worked in the shop as well, he helped out. He was a good son. He helped out and he helped his dad run the business. He got that name from that, from Ghazali, someone who spins wool. So his name was Ghazali. However, most of the historians, they say, really he was born in a specific village called Ghazali. So hence he's from, uh, he's a Ghazali, someone from the village of Ghazali. So there's some difference there as to the name of Ghazali. Um, he had, he was married, he was happily married, he had children. There is no, no historical evidence to say whether he had a son, but he had several sisters. And his mother was alive as well um, through much of his early middle period of his life. In al Ghazali, of course, just to give the date, he passed away. He died in the city or the area of al He died in the city or the area of al which is also in Iran, by the way. al is within Iran. Um, and he was 55, he was 55 years of age 
Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah when he passed away. And the year he passed away was 505 after Hijrah. So he was born 450 years after Hijrah. He died, rahimahullah, 505. So it's 55 years the only lived. <coughs> Some of his titles, Imam al-Ghazali has a long string of titles. And I'm only going to go through some of them. The most famous and well-known one is the one on the handout, Hujjat al-Islam. Hujjat al-Islam, the proof, evidence for Islam. Evidence for Islam. That is, Imam al-Ghazali was given the title that if someone wanted an evidence of the truth of Islam, they wanted an example of the truth of Islam, something that would prove Islam to be true, and correct, he had that title, Hujjat al Islam. He had another title, Zayn al Din, the, uh, the decoration, the ornament of the religion. So Imam al Ghazali was given the title of someone who gave the religion its beauty, its splendor, its intellectual beauty, meaning Islam shone through Imam al Ghazali. Hence his title, Zayn al Din. Another title, Imam al Jameel the most exalted Imam, the great Imam, the superlative Imam, the Imam whose rank is the highest, the Imam al Jaleel. The best example of the religion. Imam al Ghazali is kind of the best example of the religion. So of all the ulama who can, can be an example for Islam, his title sits above the rest. He is He's most, the best example for the religion. He had another title as well, Imam al Khurasan. Khurasan, that region where he was born, he was the whole Imam of that region. Imam al Khurasan. And because Imam al Azali also lived in Iraq, he, was, he had the title of Imam al Iraq. He was the Imam, the Imam of all of Iraq. Those are some of his titles. So this demonstrates just by some of his titles. See the, the position of Imam al Ghazali in history. How <coughs> it demonstrate his position, his uncontested position within Islam. And we know there is a hadith that is Sahih where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You see, brother, when the name of our beloved messenger is mentioned. We ought to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith, Inna Allah yab'ath bi hadhi ummati ala la'asi kulli mi'atihi sana man yujaddilu laha dinah. That Allah raises up every hundred years, every century, Allah raises up a person from this ummah from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam someone who will revive for its religion meaning renew it what was dead in the religion that, that person will renew it again give it a new life inject a new uh, energy into it again revive the sunnah that was lost everything that was lost in the religion that person will revive it every century Allah will raise a scholar from this Ummah it can be scholars as well, not just one person, yeah, but it could be a few. But uh, in every century, Allah will raise a mujaddid, a renewer of the religion. And historically, there has always been some disagreement as to who exactly was the mujaddid of his time. But when it came to Imam al Ghazali, the Prophet of Islam, there was ijma, there was no disagreement. There was absolute consensus that the mujaddid, the one who renewed Islam for his time, was Imam al Ghazali. He was the mujaddid of his time. He renewed the Sunnah. He renewed what was lost. He defended Islam definitively in his time. And no one, no one disputes that position for Imam al Ghazali. So that just shows you his position to such an extent. That Imam Subki, another Shafi'i scholar, great Shafi'i scholar, Taqlidin al Subki, the grandson, he said that in his biographical book, Tabakat al Shafi'i al Kubra, he says that if, if 
No, not that it would have happened, but if, hypothetically, there were to come a prophet other than our prophet, it would have been Imam al -Azzai. If there were to come, there were to be another prophet, then Imam al -Azzai would have been the candidate. That's how much he revered Islam. That's how much of a status Imam al -Azzai has in our history. So, what then were some of these statements of the ulama, some of the descriptions of the ulama who were huge ulama in their own right, who were also mujahidists with themselves, mentioned about Imam al -Azzai. Well, one scholar, who was also a chef, <coughs> Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi was one of the greatest Shafi'i scholars of this community. He was the mujaddid of his time as well. He mentioned that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to jam'a uluma fi qubbatin with regards to Ghazali, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi says that this scholar is saying with regards to Imam al-Ghazali's knowledge, his position, that كأن الله تبارك وتعالى جمع كل علوم في قبة وأطلع غزال عليها. It's like as though Allah got all the knowledge that ever was under one roof, under one dome, and He brought it before Imam al-Ghazal and gave it to Imam al-Ghazal. As though Allah took all the knowledge of all the disciplines and subjects. And he brought it before Imam al Ghazali and gave it to him. That shows you the intellectual stature of Imam al Ghazali. One of his students, Muhammad bin Yahya al Mansur, and they said, Oh, he was a great scholar as well, said that Imam al Ghazali, Shafi'i al he was the second al Shafi'i. So you have Imam al Shafi'i. And then Imam al Ghazali is like the second al Shafi'i. Imam al Shafi'i, we know, one of the greatest scholars of this Ummah ever. And Imam al Ghazali is said to be the second Shafi'i. Because we mentioned, remember, Imam al Ghazali was from the Shafi'i school. Another person, As'ad al Mayhani, he said, he was also a scholar of hadith and fiqh, he says, He's quoted as saying with regards to Imam al-Ghazali لا يصل إلى معرفة علم al-Ghazali وفضل إلا من بلغ كاد يبلغ كما في عقل That anyone anyone who um, or no one can attain, can reach the level of Imam al-Ghazali unless his intellect was perfect It reached perfection no one can reach the level of Imam al-Ghazali unless his intellect, his knowledge, was perfect. Meaning Imam al-Ghazali's knowledge was vast, was encompassing, was on the highest level. So these are just some of the quotes. Just a further one to add, his, uh, someone who knew Imam al-Ghazali very well, also a historian, Abdul Faris, uh, Al Farisi, Abdul Ghafir Al Farisi, he mentions in his tarikh, in his history book, with regards to Imam al Ghazali, after quoting long, long titles of Imam al Ghazali, <coughs> he mentions that he was a Imam al Imam al Din, he was all the Imams of all the Imams in the religion. <laughs> the eyes have never seen the likes of Imam al Ghazali. Lisanan, Wabayana, Nutkan, Khafiran, Dakaan, Wafabai. No, the eyes have never seen the likes of Imam al Ghazali, whether in his expression, the way he spoke, in his intelligence, in his uh, nature, and so on. So, nothing, the eyes have seen nothing like Imam al Ghazali. So, these are just some of the statements regarding the stature, the huge maqam of Imam al Ghazali. So we know now that how revered and respected he is within the Ummah. You know, he had comprehensive knowledge of the deen. He was a, what they call a polymath. He knew so many subjects. He wasn't an expert in just one religion. He was an expert in so one aspect of religion, an expert, expert in so many aspects.
He had many shiduk, he had many teachers. Some of them were, for example, Arabi Khan from Abtus. He had uh, Nasr al Ismaili from Jurjan. Jurjan was an area also in Iran. His most famous teacher, of course, some of you may know, was Imam al Hawamain Abu Ma'ali al Juwaini. Imam al Juwaini was also a Shafi'i and one of the mujaddids of his time, one of the greatest scholars of his time. Imam al Ghazali studied eight years under Imam al Juwaini in the city of Naysabur also was in Iran. Nesabur was hit by earthquakes in, in the Middle Ages and it was completely destroyed. Um, he took hadith from a lot of sheikhs. Nesabur had a lot of scholars of hadith. Uh, Imam al-Azali Shiyuk, known with many. His sheikh in Tasawwuf, his sheikh in Sufism was Al-Farmadi, who was a student of al qushayr who was a student of Abu Abd al-Rahman al sulami who they were all Shafi'is. Uh, my research, incidentally, is on uh, Al-Sulami, Abu Abd al-Rahman Al-Sulami, who was also from Naysabur. He was also a Shafi'i and a Shafi'i scholar. And Imam al-Ghazali's Shaykh in Sufism, in Tasawwuf, was the student of Al-Qushaydi, who was perhaps uh, the, one of the greatest early Sufis in Islam. He was of Ahl Tasawwuf, and he wrote many books. So, Imam al-Ghazali learned from teachers who were part of the Shafi'i tradition within that region of Iran, Nisabur and Khorasan. Some of the works of Imam al-Ghazali just to race on, just to rush on. Imam al-Ghazali wrote over 400 books. And we have nearly all those 400 books of Imam al-Ghazali. Large number of them are only print, so they're available. Some of them are still in manuscript form, they haven't been put into a book form yet. Some of them, I'm not going to list them here, but some of the more well-known ones, for example, is the Maqasid al falasifa Imam al-Ghazali, he studied philosophy, he studied logic, metaphysics, ethics. He studied all these disciplines and he wrote a book laying out all the ideas of the philosophers called the Maqasid al falasifa the intentions of the philosophers. And so balanced was this book, so neutral and so fair was this book that it was, when it was translated into Latin after it was written, people in the Latin world used it in their universities as a textbook to study philosophy. They thought this person was a philosopher who wrote it, but it was Imam al Ghazali who wrote that book. He wrote another book called Tahafat al Falasida, the destruction or the uh, incoherence of the philosophers. You see, in Imam al-Ghazali's time, there was a rise in philosophy, the study of Greek philosophy. They were, these, they were people studying Greek philosophy and they were challenging Islamic beliefs. They were denying, for example, the, uh, the existence of the world as being something temporal and finite, meaning it was created. The philosophers denied that. They said it was eternal. Like Allah, it was eternal. The world, the universe, was eternal. It had no beginning, it will have no end. Imam al-Ghazali attacked this doctrine, this, this belief of the philosophers. Another aspect that he attacked were people were denying uh, the resurrection, Ba'ath. They were denying that human beings will be raised up again by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were denying this, the philosophers. Imam al-Ghazali refuted them to show they were in error. These philosophers also believed that Allah couldn't know particulars. Allah didn't have any specific knowledge about the creation. He had general knowledge. Allah doesn't know every, every particular thing. He only knows things in general. Imam Ghazali refuted that. That's his disbarter. This cool. So to have a philosopher is a well-known book. And anyone who studies philosophy who studies medieval philosophy, even, even to say, will have to uh, study those books of Imam al -Azali. He wrote, of course, other smaller books, like Iqtisad, a basic manual of Aqidah, and so on. But, but, as you all probably know, the most popular and famous book of Imam al Ghazali, his largest work as an encyclopedia, is the Ihya Ulum al Din, the revival or the uh, renewing of the religious sciences. Imam al-Azali 
in his time sought to bring back to life all the disciplines of Islam in his life that he felt had just died out. And he wanted to correctly renew them again, resuscitate them, give them new life. And he wrote the book Ihya Ulum al Deen, and that is considered to be his masterpiece. It was one of the final larger works he wrote in his life, and it's considered a masterpiece of work and <coughs> unequaled, unparalleled in its influence. Now, there is a quote attributed uh, to Imam al Nawawi regarding Ihya Ulum al Deen. I don't know how accurate it is to Imam al Nawawi, but this is the attribution that Imam al Nawawi said about this book. That he said, Islam. If all of the books of Islam were to disappear, and Ihya was to remain, then it would suffice for everything, every book that was destroyed. So if all the books of Islam were to be destroyed, there were to be no more books of Islam left, but the Ihya of Ulum al Din survived, that will be sufficient for us to learn about Islam or our religion. That will be sufficient for us. No other statements have been made about any other book like that. So if we lost all our knowledge of Islam, if we lost all our knowledge, and only the Ihya remained, that will be enough for us. That will be enough for us and for our deen. So, the Ihya al deen is a fantastic work. Um, it's divided up into lots of sections. It's really the final statement of Imam al Ghazali and what he thinks theology is and to solve is. And we'll touch on some aspects of it in, in just a second. So we can see just this basic, from this basic information, we can see how important Imam al Ghazali is, how respected, revered he is and the rank that he has, the daraja that he has, or the daraja that he attained, the level that he attained. Okay, so now to the life of Imam al-Zali. Imam al-Zali, of course, lived only 55 years. Not a long time, I guess, according to our standards. But his influence was huge. Beyond uh, that of anyone he used, he lived beyond 55 years. The historians, they usually divide Imam al-Ghazali's life into three periods, three, um, you could say, phases, three parts of his life. There is one, the early part, where Imam al-Ghazali was born, he grew up in his hometown, he studied in the madrasa, the local madrasa there. He then went to study, uh, in, he went to Naysabur, the city of Naysabur, and studied under Imam al Jawaini for those eight years that he mentioned. And he was, he grew very popular amongst the people there. He was very young then, he was about 22 years old. And when he studied in Nesabur for about seven, eight years, his fame grew that he was invited by the Wazir, the governor of the Khalif of the Sultan, Nidal Muk in Baghdad. He was taken there. And he, at the age of 28, because Imam Ghazali's popularity had increased so much, he's very young, 28 years old. He was given the highest position of learning in the Islamic lands at that time. He was made what you call like the head professor at that college, the Nirabiya College. At the age of 28, he reached the highest academic level he could be given. And there he taught for a couple of years. So that's the first part of his life, the early years of his life when he was a youth and in his early 20s. And then he, 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 he got a promotion to the highest position, intellectual position, in, at that time. Then there's the second period of his life, where people say, this is where Imam Ghazali fame just exploded. This is where he started refuting you know, wrong, incorrect doctrines. He started writing treatises, little books. He started writing books of theology. You know, lots of different things. He started composing books and teaching. Uh, this is the second period. So this was a very short time, about three couple of years, Imam Ghazali. So the first part of his life, we could say, ends about 484. So 30 sort of years, 30 odd years after Hijrah, 430 years sorry, after Hijrah, when Ghazali was in his early 20s. The second phase begins in 1091, 
which is uh, 484 to 488. So 488 after his reign, Mordazali, which is about 30 years, this is when he starts to get, he starts to have some serious uh, panic, confusion. He starts to question things in a, in a very basic way first. He starts to question about his religion. Things start going in his mind and he starts thinking very heavily about philosophical issues, about religion, and this was affecting his brain. And this was at the end of the second part of his life. <coughs> then the third part of his life is when he has a big breakdown. Imam Ghazali was teaching one day. Suddenly his tongue froze. He was sweating, his tongue froze, and he just couldn't speak. And he fainted. He fainted, he collapsed. He was teaching one time, and then all of a sudden, he just words still come out of his mouth. It's like Allah he says in his autobiography later on, that Allah tied his tongue up. He wouldn't even let him speak one word. And he collapsed. He collapsed while he was lecturing. He collapsed to the floor. And then later on we find out why is it that Imam al-Hazali was going through this crisis? Well, what Imam al-Hazali he mentions that. He was going through this crisis of certainty. He wasn't sure about not only his religion, he wasn't sure anymore. He, all, he started to have doubt. Doubt entered into him and it was confusing him. The other reason why he started, he mentioned why he was having these kind of inner turmoil, inner agony and confusion in his mind being torn between the dunya and the akhirah was he says that his motives, his media wasn't sincere. He feared it wasn't sincere. He was asking himself, whatever I was teaching, I was teaching fiqh, teaching usul, teaching hadith, teaching theology, ilm kalam, teaching all these subjects, yet was he doing it for fame, to please the people, or was he doing it because out of sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ghazali believed that he wasn't, his, his niyyah wasn't right. He wasn't acting on what he knew. He knew all the arguments. He knew all the, the doctrines and the beliefs. But it wasn't affecting his action. He wasn't doing amal. Imam Ghazali says, my, you know, his, his belief and his actions, they weren't coming together. And he was doubting his intention. Why was I doing this? That shook Imam Hazel, he shook him. And he said, that's it, I'm out, I'm out of it, I, I, I have to get out of here. I need to get away. And in 1091, around that time, for 11 years, Imam Hazel was wandering and learning and uh, going around the Muslim lands to Syria, you know, he goes to Damascus, going to Al-Qudus Sharif and so on. He's going to Jerusalem, wandering around, writing books and joining the circles of the ulama of Tasawwuf. He was wondering, he gave some money to his family and says, look, my head's not right. You know, I need to get away, I need to think about my life, I need to reorganize my life and think, why, why am I doing it? Why isn't it that my niya, my sincerity isn't there? Because he feared, he says in his autobiography, I fear that the doors of Jahannam were open. He was afraid that the doors of Jahannam were open to him and he was going to be thrown in there. Because he realized that, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Doing it to please the people. So people say, what a great man he is. He was a great man, of course. And this is what shook him to the core. It rattled him. And he said, that's it. I'm out of here. And like I said, he went on wandering the desert, Towns, learning, sitting with the Ulama of the Soldiers, writing books, and then finally coming back to teach for a couple of years again. Um, and this is when he wrote the Ihya Ulum Deen. And then the Sheikh Rahimahullah passed away in 505 after his week. So Imam al Ghazali was thinking about his own salvation. Am I going to get to Jannah where I'm supposed to be? 
This is what he was worried about. He felt that his inner, the inner part of him, the things that only he has access to, like all of us here, our intention, what we're really feeling. Do I really know what's in your, what you are thinking right now? No. Does anyone here know what anyone else is thinking? We don't have access to other minds. We cannot sense what's in everyone else's mind. I don't know for what reason or motive someone comes and does, why they do something. Why they're here, why we're all here, why we do anything. Only that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Now if our inside, these things like a here, all these things are wrong, meaning they're for the wrong things, then whatever we do is going to come to zero. Whatever actions we do is going to come to zero. It's going to be like sand in our hands and it's just going to pour out. It's going to come to nothing. This is what Imam al said feared. This, he felt, was his spiritual crisis. He wasn't having a crisis of, does Allah just that necessarily know? It was more of his inner self. As a person inside, his inner side wasn't conforming to what it was supposed to conform to the Sharia. And in that 11 years of wandering, Imam al-Mazali put together his program of tasawwuf, his program of how to purify the nafs, how to rectify the heart, how to get the heart to the place that it's supposed to be and be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was what he spent the later years of his life and this is what the historians say is the third period of Imam al-Mazali's life. So his spiritual journey began then. And then when he finally came back, of course, he taught, he carried on teaching, and again his fame just grew more and more, more and more he multiplied. Okay, so coming to the point now of Imam al Azali's Tasawwuf. You know, there is no way, there is no way that we are going to be able to even start to, how can I say, work our way through this beautiful but very dense forest of Imam Ghazali's work. I mean, there's no way we can even begin to start to touch on all the aspects of this Tosobo. But one way I felt I wanted to do really was to share some quotes from Imam Ghazali's text that he wrote to a student of his asking him about advice. And in that we can start to glimpse what Imam al-Azali's soul is about. What is it that he's emphasizing? We don't have to go into the details, specifically what he said on what page, and what does that term mean. This, of course, scholars have debated and discussed, but for our purposes, we can't really um, benefit from that unless we study the subject in some depth. But I want to share some statements about Imam al-Azali that he wrote like I said to one of his students who asked him about advice. And Imam Ghazali has lots of advice, but he, there are some quotes that I thought I would share as worth knowing so then we get an idea of what his Tasawwuf is about. What is his Sufism about? So we know that Imam Ghazali, anyone who studies his books, in a basic way, his Tasawwuf is based on the Quran, it's based on the Hadith. It's based on the lives of the Sahaba and it's based on the lives of the ulama of Tasawwuf. <coughs> Imam Ghazali quotes a lot from the ulama of Tasawwuf and uh, those who taught, uh, um, you know, had those teachings and passed them on. He, drew, he draws on from much earlier books like from Abu Talib al Makki, the Qutb al Qulub, uh, the works of Imam al Muhasibi, who, you know, who is Phenomenal. Perhaps one of the greatest shaykhs, Imam al Muhasibi, definitely the shaykh of the nafs. <coughs> if there's anyone who knew how to master the nafs and control it, Imam al Muhasibi was that shaykh, was that Imam. He drew from the books of these two Imams and other, of course, uh, scholars in his time. And um, really, if we were to try and equate or try and say what does Imam, in one statement, what does Imam al Azali's Tasawwuf tell us? Well, in one statement we could say conformity to the law. It has to agree with the Sharia. And here's a quote. 
from the peace book, Ayyuhan Walad, O oh, beloved student or O oh, beloved disciple, where Imam Ghazali, he writes advice to that student. And he said, the student asks him, what about ibadah? Everyone does it, pray, fala, so on. What is ibadah really? I want to know what obedience and ibadah is. And Imam Ghazali writes, I'lam. Know. And be aware, you've got to know this. I'lam. Know. And the ta'a. Well, the ibadah. That obedience and worship. These two things, obedience and worship, have to be it has to um, follow or agree with the law, i.e. the sharia, or mutab or sharia, or has to agree with what Allah legislates, what Allah tells us. So what Allah commands us to do, and what Allah tells us that we have to stay away from, so Allah's commands and prohibition. Ibadah and ta'a is conformity to this. In statements, in your words, and in your actions. So it's not enough for us, our statements, what we say to agree with the sharia. What we do must agree with the sharia. In other words, he says, يعني كل ما تفعلوا كل ما تفعلوا everything that you do وتقول and you say وتترك يقول بإقتداء الشر everything that you say everything that you do everything that you believe has to be in accordance with the Sharia the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it ain't anyone else's law it has to conform to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Sharia so which means anyone who wants to do to something, anyone who even wants to start the hard process of training their nafs, training that ego that we've got inside, that personality we've got inside us, you can't do it unless what you say, what you do, is in agreement with the Sharia. And then Imam Ghazali he says, and he says to the student, look. You have to also know one more thing. Just to emphasize the point. And he emphasizes it again. Look, you have to make what you say, what you do, agree with the Sharia. Why? Why? Because someone can ask why. He says, if, because, al ilm wal amal. Why? Because al ilm wal amal bila iqtidaat al shar dalala. Any action, any, any knowledge, everything you learn, what you learn in terms of your knowledge, which means the ideas that you learn, the concepts that you pick up, the teachings that you take, and everything you do, it, it will be nothing, it will be dalala, it will be error if it didn't conform to the Sharia. It's our knowledge. Our knowledge. What we learn. Of course, what we do have to agree, has to agree with the Sharia, but what we learn has to be based on Islam. Has to be based on Islamic law. What the Sharia defines as being, or what our, our Aqidah defines as being correct, and what our law defines as action as being correct. Anyone who thinks that they can learn knowledge and it not be based on Islam and actions that are not based on the Islamic criteria, this is Bolan. And then he goes on to say that, look, if you want to study Tasawwuf, if you want to study this aspect of purifying yourself, stay away from the Shatahat of Sufi. Stay away from those statements of the Sufis that really it can confuse you and it's best if the Sufi didn't say it in the But some people who might know some imams, they might write some poetry or whatever or talk in ways which you think, oh my god, is that even is that even Islamic, is that even right? Surely you can't say that. For some Sufis, when they contemplate Allah, when they do the dikid, 
they are overwhelmed so much in the moment that they say stuff that seems like it's, it's out of this world. And this is where like, the misconception comes in. Oh, you study Sufism, or oh, you're reading books as if they're a bit wacky, aren't they? They're, they're a bit funny, they're a bit crazy. They live in the clouds, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, they're deviant. It's because of this, the Shatahat of Sufiya. Because of what the, the Sufis say, their utterances, when they were you know, contemplating Allah in such a heavy state. So Imam Azali says, look, right, stay away from that stuff. If you want to really uh, do to Sawwuf, he says, I advise you then to do the following. To do the real part of the Sawwuf, he says. He says, the suluk of al tariq the way of this method of the ulama of the Sawwuf is mujahidat al-nafs. Mujahidat al-nafs. You struggling against yourself, your your soul, your ego, you're struggling, your nafs tells you, let's go to this place. Yet you know you're not allowed to go there. Your nafs tells you, you shouldn't be watching it. Let's watch this. And you know you shouldn't be watching it. Your nafs tells you, stay quiet and don't speak out against this thing. But you know you're supposed to speak out against oppression. This is our nafs. It tells us one thing. You're going to be in trouble if you say this. You're going to be able to speak. You're going to be, you know, you're going to lose your job. The nafs tells us this, that we have to stay silent and kufr. Whereas the haq, we have to, we have to speak the haq wherever we see the dhulm being done. Even if it's against ourselves and if it's uh, done by Muslims. We have to speak the truth. So, mujahid al nafs is hard. It, that's why it's called jihad al nafs. You're struggling, you're literally combating yourself. You're literally trying to fight the nuts, saying, no, mate, I'm not going to allow it. And that's hard. So, mujahid al nafs, you have to do. And then, qabr al shahwat al nafs. How do you break? How do you stop you from having bad desires? How do we do that? All of us, we're human beings, of course, we're going to have this. How do we do it? That is what the path of the ulama of Tasawwuf talk about. It's not about smoking and being in the clouds and floating. It's not that. It's about mujahidat al nafs, staying up at night. Ibadah. So the more you do ibadah, the only person on your mind is Allah. And no room for you, for you to think about your nafs and the dunya in that sense. So it's got to be, it's got to be mujahidat al nafs, qat'u shahwat al nafs, breaking the desires of the nafs. Desires of the nafs. Killing what it likes. What the nafs likes. Kill it. It's not taking a knife and stabbing your heart. That's not going to be, this is not literal. What it is, you have a very rich imagery where they talk about. It's you. Think of your nafs as your enemy. Imagine it's there. You're in, you're in combat now, you're battling against it. He's telling you. Don't speak out against Zulm. Keep quiet. And you're saying, I can't do that for Islam. I have to forbid the bunker. And you, you give him one strike. And he blocks it. And it's like that. You know, so that's how it internally is. And that's why you wrestle with yourself. That's why you can see some people are torn between this way and that way. And you remember he was going through this in his early part of his life. He was wrestling with all this stuff. And he says, you have to do this with the sword of training. So how do you kill your nafs, metaphorically? How do you kill it? Through training. How does an athlete reach his, his or her peak? With the Olympics coming out, come around the corner a couple of years, he must save a budget. How, do we, how does an athlete get to its peak through training? No man can run the 100 meters or a woman under 10 seconds flat, he's got to do some training. This is what they, they call sports, riyadat, obviously in Arabic. Here, riyadat isn't sports, you go out and have a job in tennis. No, not necessarily. It's to do with more training your nafs to the dhikr of Allah. Tilal of the Quran. Contemplating Allah's attributes. That might mean you personally doing actions like doing it quietly in your own house. That's one way of doing it. 
or you being in a group with jama'ah in society where you sit and learn. So kind of social learning. You see, human beings, and you know what Azali teaches, human beings don't live alone. No one can live alone. Human beings don't make to live alone. Sometimes it helps to remove yourself so you get some perspective. Just like with anything, when you go away on a holiday for a little while, have a little weekend break somewhere, and then you come back to work or wherever to the family, you get some, you get a fresh perspective. It's like that. It doesn't mean you live in the desert necessarily and then you, know, you get sunburned and so on. It's not that. You know, we're social creatures. You know, we have to learn in the social environment. So the way to purify your nafs is not just by yourself, but it's got to be with people. It's got to be doing and following everything that Allah commands us to do. That's what Imam Ghazali is saying. What you do, your purification must be based on Islam. How Islam tells you you've got to purify it. Your nafs has to be killed the way Islam defines it. Not the way I want to define it. I'm not allowed to define acts of worship. In Islam, none of us can just make up in your rule. We can't make it up and say, yeah, that's part of Islam. So then you remember Zeli further gives some advice to the student. And I want to just read you, he gives him four, because the person is a beginner, is a novice, you remember Zeli says, look, what I'm going to tell you, I've written in my books, in my other books, especially the Ihya al and I want to distill it down into four points for you. The first point he says, is that, an amr al the first thing you have to have is the i'tiqad al sahihun la yakun fihi bid'ah. You have to have a correct aqidah. Your aqidah must be sahih. La yakun fihi bid'ah. There can't be any bid'ah in your aqidah. You, your aqidah has to be the sahih aqidah. That of the salaf, of what the Prophet taught us about. If you have funny aqidah, funny ideas, like the philosophers in his time, you have funny ideas like the Bartaniya in his time, there were a group that believed that there were certain imams that had secret knowledge, and no one else knew that knowledge, only these secret imams, and they taught it to people. And they were known as the Bartaniya. And you remember, you remember Zali saying, anyone who wants to start by themselves, he's not mentioning a shaykh necessarily, anyone who wants to begin the hard work of purifying the nafs, has to have a correct aqidah. Because if your foundation isn't sound, everything else won't be sound. So you have to have <coughs> Then he says, Al-Amr al-Thani, or Wathani, the second thing you have to have out of the four, he says, Tawbatun nasurun la yalji'u ba'daha ila zalla. You have to have, if you want to start something new, if you want to start, you've got to begin with Tawbah. You've got to make repentance to Allah and say, Allah, look, I'm, I'm going to try. You know, forgive my, my, my previous sins, but I'm going to try new slate to try really hard to purify myself according to your law. Not to return to the Zayla, to that, to these slips, to these errors. To remove yourself from this error, try and stop yourself from going into this error and ask, make sincere told of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawbah to Musur. And then he says a third one, which is quite interesting. And then he says, it's the Ba'a of Khusum. Really to settle all, all the issues you've had with people before. Anything you've done. Anything that people have argued with you about, debated with you about, any kind of baggage you've got, clear that up. So that someone can't use that against you or make a claim against you. Because if you're having a fresh start, you want a clean slate, you've got Sahih Aqidah, you make a problem from that, you know, get rid of all that baggage. Get rid of all that baggage. So that no one can claim something against you. And then the fourth, Fourth one, you remember Zeli mentions out of, out of what a person needs. If they want to take the four things away in trying to do to solve it, the fourth one, he says, That is the 
that is to learn to learn to have knowledge of to learn everything about the Sharia according to our capacity and ability that will um, lead us or lead us to um, you know, following and obeying the commands of Allah correctly and then he says so the first thing we have to have is knowledge of the Sharia we need to know what's right and what's wrong before we can act because we might do an action and then it's prohibited by Allah see most of us what we do is we act before we seek the hukum we do things and we say oh Shaykh am I allowed to do this and the Shaykh says have you started it yet he's like yeah I've done it I'm in a mess what do I do and then when the Shaykh says you're not allowed to do it you're in trouble <coughs> so we got to try and know the hukum of Allah before we act and Imam Ghazali says, everyone, for those who are sincerely trying to learn the deen and mean purify themselves in that way, has to know knowledge of the Sharia according to their ability so they can worship Allah. Now brothers, this is a very, very important point. Very, very important point. And then Imam, I'll come to that mention how why right, Imam Ghazali mentioned that then you can learn other sciences. Then you can learn other sciences. So you can learn other sciences that will help you and save you in the akhirah. Like the sciences of Islam, Tafsir, Ulum, and Hadith. But his emphasis is on ilm, Tafsir, Ulum, and Sharia. Knowledge of Islamic law. So no one, no one can say that the ulama of Tasawwuf is definitely the ones that Imam Ghazali is talking about and following are people who do not follow the Sharia. How can you be Sufi? How can you be someone who, whoever you are, whether Sufi or not, someone who just wants to make their internal aspect, the personality, in conformity to, to the law, the Islamic law, how can someone do that following the Sharia? The other point, brothers and sisters, to read is that when Ghazali is talking about knowing having knowledge of the law, there might be some things if we don't have knowledge of, we won't be able to fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We saw the video up on there. I mean, everyone knows what's going on around the world, right? Everyone knows what's going on around the world in terms of uh, against Muslims and what Muslims are doing and so on. Or what was taking place against Muslims. Now we would be in a serious in serious trouble, in serious situation, if we didn't know what the commandment of Allah was regarding this particular problem. We would be in trouble if we don't have a from Islamic law, from what Islam tells us. You see, the Sharia isn't just legal stuff. We have an understanding our Sharia is broader than that, it encompasses moral <coughs> Um, spiritual laws, political laws, economic, so on, domestic law, it covers all of that, it's not just legal law. Sharia is a, is a term that covers all these aspects. Now we will be in trouble. We will be in trouble and hence we will not be fulfilling how to purify us correctly if we don't know that aspect or those knowledges that will help us to fulfill the commandment of Allah. We know, we know that the uh, the position of the Muslims, the situation of the Muslims is very, very serious and Allah has a commandment for that. Allah, there is a hukum for this particular problem. And if we don't have knowledge of this particular problem, then we're not, complete, we're not completing our riyadatul nafs. We're not completing our training of our nafs. How can we, if we're ignoring one of the big aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the position of the Muslims and the, the serious situation they found themselves in, under attack, occupation and so on. How can we be ignorant of all the ahkam and commands of Allah relates to this issue? How can we say that our nafs is safe if we are doing good in our house, but we know that outside of what's going on around the world, in the Muslim community, whether the half hands are outside, and we don't know what the command of Allah is in order to act to solve the problem? You see? We will only be fulfilling half the task. We can't say that's not part of real world and nafs. That's not part of nafs training. That's not part of mujahid and nafs. How can it not be? It's part of the commands of Allah. And we need to have knowledge regarding the commandments of Allah so we know what is the solution to that problem from Islam. 
So the ayat mentioned at the beginning of Surah Al-Ra'ad, the ayat of Kareem. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيْرُ بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيْرُ مَا بِأَنْفُسِهِمْ Allah does not change the condition of the people until they can change or until they change what is within themselves. مَا بِأَنْفُسِهِمْ And this is not مَا بِتَخْسِيش This is not مَا that just specifically refers to something. This is what the Prophet says, مَا بِعْمُونَ What everything that is inside you as a person, as people, as a قوم So whatever is inside you that is relevant to you as a قوم you must change. Change to what? That's the question. Change to what? Change it so I can decide what I want? No. Imam Ghazali advised you change it in accordance with the Sharia. What other law, what other standards do you want to change it to? <coughs> what other standards are you going to want? If you change it to another standard, you are not following the path of the Holy Quran to solve. Because Imam Ghazali clearly said that you have to. Your, everything you say, everything you do, every, everything you believe and abandon must be based on the iqtida of shari. Otherwise he says it's talad, otherwise it's misguidance. The problem is sometimes we might think the scope for us is very narrow. No, the commandments of Allah are very wide. The commandments of Allah don't just relate to us as individuals only. They relate to every aspect of our life. And we need to know and have knowledge of the Sharia related to all those aspects. So the ayah in the Quran is not just restricted to nafs as in what some people commonly understand that you just do personal ibadah. How can it be? Well here the ma, the, part, the particle ma is al ma'um. Ma bi anfusihim, everything that is in you. Everything that is in you, and in you as a people, or relevant to you as a people, can mean what? Yes? Your, your nafs, the state of your nafs. It could be the ideas that you carry. It could be the ideas you carry, the thoughts you have. All these have to be in agreement with Islam. Like Imam Ghazali says, your ihtiqad has to be sahih. And that's the first thing he mentioned. That if your ideas are like the Greeks, because in his time it was the Greeks, if your ideas are like the philosophers, if your ideas are like the Neoplatonists, the Aristotelians, if your ideas are like them, the Bartaniya, then your aqidah is a sahih. Similarly, like us, if our ideas are not based on Islam, then we're in trouble. We're in trouble. How can we step onto the path of purifying ourselves if our aqidah is completely out of question? I know I'm running out of time. I quickly want to just jump onto some lessons we can draw from Imam al-Azali's life. Wallahi, there's so many lessons to draw, but I only want to pick out five very, very quickly. Maybe that we, inshallah ta'ala, maybe we can try and uh, use that as guidance and practically implement it in our lives to follow the Imam in his footsteps. One, one thing that I think is worth mentioning about the influence of Imam al Ghazali's life, um, if I can find the, no uh, the note, is Imam al Ghazali is talking about having um, your, it is not enough that you just theoretically learn something and it sits in your head. That's not enough. You can be the brainiest dude. You know you might know all the hadith. You might be a geezer who knows all of the muhaddithun and their names and so on. You might know all the isnad. You might know even all the scholars aqwal on this isnad. All the scholars statements on this isnad. You might know all the books. You might memorize them off by heart. You might, you might memorize all these different classical texts. It is nothing, it is nothing unless your actions are in conformity to the Sharia and you act on what you know. Imam Azali was always emphasizing this. It's not enough just to have theoretical knowledge. And him, he, his early life was about that, he was questioning himself. I had it all in here. And it never filtered into here. He was to make his limbs move to worship Allah. This is what Imam al muhasibi he says, Beware of worshiping Allah with your intellect. <coughs> you might know everything as information, just in your head. But that doesn't mean your limbs are going to move. That doesn't mean your limbs are going to move in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, our emotions, our feelings, our inclinations, all must conform to the Sharia inwardly and outwardly. One is deluded to think if the inward is purified and the outward is not, 
rectify that they're safe, and vice versa. You need both together, both together. And this rectification is not a, just a personal thing that you do behind closed doors. Second point, Imam al Hazel says, anyone who even thinks about abandoning the Sharia, there's no hope for that person. They can't even imagine to be on the correct way. Forget being on the way of the Sari Qum, those who are treading the path to solve. Anyone who abandons the Sharia thinking the Sharia is secondary or tertiary, is not important, that will they suspend uh, following the Sharia or put conditions on following the Sharia, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. The Sharia is the basis. And in the quotes that we mentioned, Imam Ghazali reiterates that again and again and again. The rules are always because this deen cannot be established without its law. And Imam Ghazali mentions that many, many times. That this law will uphold the rights. The Sultan, the Khalifa, will uphold, if he implements Islam correctly, will uphold the rights of the people. And Imam Ghazali says, if there isn't this authority, if it's not there, the people's rights will not be given and people will fall into the and so on. So, you're deluded, we are deluded to think we can uh, uh, correctly practice Islam without adhering to the Sharia. Never. Imam Ghazali, the third lesson we could learn from him, he devoted his life, early and later life, to refuting the bid'ah in his time. Imam Ghazali wasn't preoccupied, the bid'ah in his time wasn't bid'ah, was, can you use subh, can you use tasbih, mawlid and so on, no. The bid'ah in his time was bid'ah in thought, in aqidah. The Greek philosophers were challenging the Islamic aqidah. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek philosophy that was taught and that was learned by Muslims was challenging the orthodox creed. It was challenging Islamic belief. Imam al-Ghazali devoted his life to refuting those. And in fact, it is said that after Imam al-Ghazali refuted the Islamic Greek philosophy in his time, philosophy just closed up shop. It was like it didn't thrive in the East anymore after Imam Ghazali refuted it, buried it in, in, in the ground. What lesson can we take from that? Dear brothers and sisters, we know that there are challenges and attacks on Islam <coughs> even until as we speak now. What are the attacks on Islam? It is not about putting our hands here. It is not about how you pray. This is not the attack on Islam. This is not the victim that's, that's putting us up. Is the challenges of intellectual challenge, the attack on Islamic values, the attack on Islamic Sharia, the attack on using double standards of democracy, feeding Muslims incorrect ideas that are not from Islam, and we're told that we need to take this. We are forced to take it, otherwise we'll be labeled and such and such. We need to take the spirit of Imam al just as he attacked the Greek philosophers in Islam. We need to be aware and try and stop people from attacking Islamic faith, its laws, its values, its system. If Imam Ghazali, wallahi, if Imam Ghazali was around this time, do you think he would have let this onslaught carry on against Islamic faith? Do you think he would allow Islamic values to be attacked? Do you think Imam Ghazali would allow the Sharia to be attacked and mocked? Do you think uh, all of our ahkam to be ridiculed? I don't know. But he addressed the problem in his time, the bid'ah in his time. And we need to address the conceptual bid'ahs in our time. A fourth lesson that we can learn from Imam Ghazali. Wallahi, Imam Ghazali had, had a fantastic idea of tolerance. You see, one problem that we have in, amongst ourselves in the community, we declare <coughs> some other group or some other person as being a deviant, a mubtadi' or he's a kafir. We declare takfir on them. Just because what they believe doesn't agree with, with some scholar who they follow. This is a fear mentality. We need to get rid of that. It's dangerous to use that word kufr over a Muslim. Just because you, you think some of these views are strange or you've never heard of it before. That intolerance Imam Ghazali didn't stand for. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning Imam Ghazali was of broadly the Ash'ari school. But, but, he knew some of his colleagues and people in his time were fanatically following Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, such that anyone who disagreed with Imam al Ash'ari, they declared that person as being a careful. And Imam al Zali says, What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The great scholars of Islam were also Ash'ari, 
differed from Imam al Mash'ari. Are you going to call them a kafir? Some of Imam Abu Bakr al Baqir Dani. He didn't agree with Imam al Mash'ari in all areas, but he was Mash'ari himself. Does that mean Imam Abu Bakr, Abu, Abu, Abu Bakr al Baqir Dani is kafir? No. Even Imam al Ghazali did not declare kufr on the Muhammad. He said, their aqeedah fusaq fi aqaidihim. Their aqeedah has deviancy in it. But it doesn't reach the level where I can, in most parts, say you are kafir. Because kafir means you are outside of Islam. Which means if you're married, your wife has to divorce you. It means by the legal reason your blood can be spilled. That's serious. That is a serious charge. We need to steer away. Imam Azali wasn't preoccupied with giving takfir day in, day out. And where there's a difference of opinion, he said, la takfir fi furu'ah. You can't give takfir in areas, branches of the faith where people disagree. I disagree with someone in certain areas. Someone disagrees with me, and we both don't have an understanding based on Islam. I can't say you're careful, mate. Because you don't follow what I follow, you must be careful. That's a serious charge. That is serious. We need to take a lesson from Imam al and say, no, we're going to hold this tolerance. We are not going to let the word kufr slip onto our tongues and out our mouths so easily. Like some Muslims do, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry to say. It's scared of talking to some of these Muslims because you don't know what they might do to feel on you. But what here we might, we might laugh, but it's serious. It's serious. And we know about one Muslim calling another Muslim carefully. Very, very serious. You don't want to go down that route. Imam Ghazali never went down that route. This is why even when he was refuting the philosophers, he never said they are kafir. He said if they deny that Allah knows everything, whether well, in all particulars, Allah knows everything that someone can do, has done, and even counterfactual of what they may do, or what they would have done. If they, if they deny that, yes, then they're denying one of the names of Allah, and Allah knows everything, and Ali, and so on. If they deny resurrection, the philosophers are talking about, yes, then they'll be careful. If, 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 if. Whereas we don't say if. We straight away will jump in and we declare this person, that person, deviant. And I find it astonishing. No one can find that from the life of Imam al-Azali, rahimahullah. He wrote a little treatise on it, talking about that we should call for more tolerance in that respect. Worst comes to worst, if someone does happen to hold uh, a belief that is not orthodox, but it is in the branches of the aqidah, the areas where there can be discussion, we cannot declare the person careful, unless he denies something definitively established in the deen. Lastly, and I will conclude here, the last lesson we can take from Imam al-Azali is that Imam al-Azali was very insistent. He always insisted on the need for there to be an authority of the Muslim. He emphasizes again and again and again that we need a sultan, a adil. We need a just imam. Why? Because this, through this imam, the sharia that he's talking about, that we have to follow, can be administered. It can be implemented. So, not because to make some people powerful, not because to make some people rich, not because to make some people uh, have a higher position and status in the dunya, no to administer the rights Allah has given that human beings uh, must have to protect the religion, to protect the honor, to protect the unity of the Muslim, to protect the internet, and so on and so on. The, the, the sultan, the authority that needs to be in place, the khilafah that Imam al-Ghazali is talking about, this is what alone will administer the rights correctly to the Muslims and non-Muslims, protect the religion and safeguard it from, like I said, threats, external threats and so on. And this can only be done, Imam al Zali mentions again and again, under Sultan Adi, under just Imam, without which uh, the, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be implemented.